Okay, uh, we are being recorded, Banu. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure and uh, thrill to start our super special March edition, Living Histories in 2023, with uh, first talk from Banu Askan from ASU. Please take it away, Banu. Tell us about Living Many Histories. Um, so, Thank you, Sharif, for giving an opportunity to share our little histories to everyone. I put the title Stochastic Steps in Life. So as the big question, if you replay the same tape, why not replay the tape? Will you end the, the same pathway of evolution? I think it's the same for the life too. If I happen to replay my life, I don't know if I will be where I am now because there's always the cast to see how serendipity happens. So, uh, so just just go with the flow is an important thing, I guess. So therefore, I wanted to say there's a lot of stochastic steps that took me here, but someone were lucky, and so I'm happy where we are, and I'm so happy that what I'm doing, which I have passion, right? That's really a privilege. So my story obviously starts um, in Turkey because I was born and raised in this uh, country in Turkey. Half is like Asia, like with the another part part of Europe. So I was in a like a middle mixed culture of Eastern and West meat in that region, right? And since I was a little kid, I was really really um, curious. So learning new things it was the only motivation. I always you know. Uh, look for stuff, try to understand how things work, broke a lot of things on the way. And while I was like a little kid child, I didn't have like what to do when I hit high school. I had no clue <laughs> what, you know, which major should I pick? The only thing I know that my family were physicians. I didn't want to be a physician. That's all I knew. And then I thought about like a school, like this was a um, school, the college I was uh, I attended eventually. That was my goal. I went to go to this school. It was in uh, the middle of Bosphorus. You see this nice view of the Bosphorus. And this was, um, and I think that was an inter it was one of the best schools in Turkey to attend. You have to work very hard to get high schools to get the school. But that was my goal. I really wanted to enter the school called Bazici University. And partly because I know education was good because I was also impressed with the view. <laughs> so like, it was like, I wasn't really you know all I know, what, but you can get a better education if you go to school. Uh, one thing interesting about the school was school was uh, founded by American uh, missionaries at the time, then given to the Turkish government later. So education was in English and the whole infrastructure was, mimicking American school when I maybe became a faculty in US or start my education in US, I was already familiar with this, like that might stochastically help me to go through a certain hurdle in a sense, right? And so, and the school was great uh, because it was, it was very democratic, very keen on diversity. And that allowed me to have many friends from different backgrounds, really shaped my personality to be open, fair, and inclusive. And in our education, everything is like a very, like all the engineering, I was an engineering student at the time, take every classes together with other students. And I also take many diverse classes, including photography and cinematography. And all those things actually, in a sense, help you when you go face real life in a sense but so much expose yourself to different classes even so you think it's not related it's very important but on the other hand I also and it also give you a little bit fun to take these different classes I took psychology sociology philosophy on top of all other uh, required engineering classes but I think it was crucial to shape my self as an adult in real life when I start working and also I worked really hard to get a strong foundation and stand like I really worked really hard and try to understand to the core. And I think that's also important uh, when you're doing like a bachelor degree. And um, again, another stochastic thing is I was, while I was studying, I ended up this, there was a center called Palmer Resource Center. 
It uh, was fun with those two people here, Yvette Bahar and Barack Erman. Maybe some of you guys know Yvette Bahar. Uh, he, she is a faculty right now in Stony Brooks and also um, director of Locker Center at the moment. But that time she was at Wazich. She was one of my favorite teacher. The class I took, which was physical chemistry, I was in love. And I learned that she does some research in the center called Polymer Research Center. I had, and I intrigued and I said, can I come and do something with you? She was very open. So, and, and I learned how to do research, why research is fun in the center doing some polymer physics. At the moment they were doing polymer physics. So indeed, for me, it, well, I was lucky to find a really a great mentor and a role model. And that allowed me to really find what my actual passion was. And um, at the moment, Brock and Yvette, Yvette decided that she wants to do something different. So she said, oh, I want to, I, I, I gave up this uh, inorganic uh, polymer, like uh, polymers, instead of synthetic polymers. I want to really understand uh, organic macromolecules, particularly proteins. So she start, she opened the specific uh, special class that I attend. I said, oh, that's interesting. I want to take that special class. Why not? <laughs> Being, you know, open. And suddenly she introduced me with this question called so-called protein folding problem, right? So the problem of like, there is 20 type of amino acid. They have a specific sequence that specific sequence turn into a specific fault, right? This was very popular in like late early 90s, late 90s, beginning of things. Everybody was, you know, computers were getting faster and everybody was trying to understand can you use some tools to really understand computationally the three-dimensional structure. I found that quite interesting. I said, this is such a cool problem. And suddenly find my problem to do a PhD for like, that was really interesting. Then I dig around papers around this and I came across this energy funnel landscape. I said, oh, that's really cool. While I was reading this papers and thinking why this was a cartoon and funnel landscape, I realized there's this person uh, in the papers that I don't know can do. His papers was really great and very like clear. I said, oh, this is such a cool person. So then I said, I like to work with him. And uh, I apply a fellowship. I was still doing my PhD at the beginning in Turkey at the moment. And I said, I will apply a PhD fellowship and get some funding to start a collaboration with Ken, right? And I, I mean, I didn't know. So what interesting about is Ken knew actually Brock Erman. This is why it's a serendipity, serendipity and stochasticity. I have no clue Ken and Brock know each other because they overlap in Paul Fleury's lab. So when I write and then I explain which group and Ken got interesting and he's a very nice person and he always welcome everybody anyway. So I start working with Ken and then I ended up showing like a very simple lattice model that indeed folding can look like it from the landscape. That was the first paper we did with Ken and we were very excited. We learned a lot about folding kinetics, how white proteins folding. And that later my, uh, after this was my, one of my um, uh, paper I published during my PhD years after getting my degree, I continued the work with Ken as a postdoctoral fellow and we continue to understand, like uh, saying how that little model can be realistic if you use the molecular dynamic simulations. Again, that time, these are like, if you do 2000s, the computers wasn't that fast. And uh, so and we want to understand how proteins fold fast and how we can build a sampling strategy that we can reach the folded state in using com. Uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Long story short, we learned that if you chop the protein sequence into little segments, rather than simulating the whole sequence as whole, if you simulate simple fragments, you can find this tiny uh, interaction so strong that can beat local entropy. And if you lack that 
step and say what will be the next step which has the minimum entropy cost to make the next interaction and grow those uh, folding units and like a folding model, you can quickly reach a folded state in the molecular dynamics simulation too. That was very uh, exciting for us at the time. And I think that work, I really love that work. And that was a segue for me to get my a position in academia as an independent PI at um, Arizona State University. So, oh, I think, one, sorry, this is your 10 minute mark. Oh, all right. Okay. So, can I say something? So, I want to skip this. Oh, so, all, right. all this. And I want to say quickly this. So, for everybody here who wonder how you get an academic job, my mentors give this advice all the time to us, both of them, which are very established and to National Academy members. They say that to get an academic position, you have to do perfect earth shattering science, and you have to show how you communicate these as strong letters, which will open the door, but then you need to communicate well and show that you can communicate well, you can get funding, and you can pull your weight to do what you want. So these are very important things to get a job. And Ken has a little um, equation to say what earth shattering science is. I'd like to share with you that one too, which is your science should be very impactful. Also, when you do this, it has a high weight of decisiveness. Then you should have a surprise that people say, oh, wow, I wouldn't expect that but that will be rigorously continuous with the debt. And one critical thing is no matter what you do, you have to have a clear clarity that it should be an understandable that for everybody, not only that they understand and they appreciate well. So I think this part, sometimes we scientists ignore that clarity, understandability, which I think very important. And uh, with that, I'll thank Shri again. Um, yeah, I'll turn to smile and I'll give the next speaker. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Banu, on behalf of the audience. Um, we have time for a couple of quick questions while audience warm warms up. I want to ask you a first question about, you explained so nicely why uh, you were stochastically put into the American system early on in Turkey. Um, and that helped you direct you towards the American system. But would you tell us some of the things that were different for you as an immigrant woman in the United States? Okay. Um, uh, so obviously culture is very different in the US uh, than Turkey, right? So um, when I went to like, I guess, uh, is it, students um i think uh to find the people in turkey i guess as i said the the inclusion was so much stronger like in my university for some reason it was all resolved and uh, us first of all i was a stranger <laughs> and a lot of people in the group was like local so i have to break the ice and um <laughs> tell this um people like, you know, I'm like you and get common grounds to really also fight the friendship like that, because it's very important. You learn most from your peers, not your mentors at a, at a graduate, at a certain level. So for that, you have to have a lot of friends. And that was, and from a different culture and learned at other cultures and, you know, to get to know them and find a common ground was a little bit harder, but it wasn't that difficult. But education system was so similar that was also easy to adapt. Um, yeah, that I guess that was the thing, like you have to find a common ground with the other uh, local people to break the ice was uh, like a little barrier, but it wasn't that difficult anyway. Thank you so much. On that note, again, thanks on behalf of the audience. I'm closing the recording and thanks for a really inspiring talk.